afternoon. Uh, this is the City of Philadelphia's briefing on the response to COVID-19. A reminder, this is for press only. If you are logged into the Zoom room uh, and you are not a member of the press, please log out and you can watch on one of the live streams, including the Department of Public Health's Twitter account, as well as PHLGov TV on Comcast Channel 64 or Verizon Channel 40. Please be aware also that we're going to change up the order of things for today's press conference because Dr. Farley has um, some significant announcements. We want to give ensure there is significant, uh, sufficient time uh, for questions. So we're going to move Armando's translation of the remarks of the mayor and Dr. Farley until the end at 2 p.m. So the Q&A portion will come first. Spanish language reporters who are on should still ask your questions during the regular Q&A, and Onda will be here to translate. And with that, we begin our briefing with opening remarks from Mayor Kenny. Mayor, you have the floor. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. As many of you are aware, we announced yesterday that Children's Hospital of Philadelphia will assist part in public health in a new school COVID-19 vaccination program. This effort is intended to inoculate teachers, principals, and staff at all schools in Philadelphia. This includes staff at all district-run, charter, independent, and pro schools, as well as at child care centers and pre-K providers. Classroom aides and cafeteria workers will also be included. The vaccination effort is expected to begin by the end of February and expand to a number of locations, including pop-up clinics located in school buildings throughout the city. Further operational details are still being developed, but we want to get the word out now. We near the one-year anniversary of the pandemic getting children back into classrooms throughout the city is vitally important to their future. We're thrilled to see Children's Hospital of Philadelphia stepping up in a major way for our kids. While I fully support Dr. Height's plan to have students back in classrooms the week of February 22nd, we also know this vaccination program will go a long way toward easing some of the concerns that teachers have expressed to us. It is imperative that our children get back to in-person learning. And every Philadelphian should be thankful that CHOP is able to offer its resources and expertise for this crucial effort. I want to just quickly mention one other important matter. We have spoken before about the Philadelphia COVID-19 Restaurant and Gym Relief Program. This is our latest effort to provide at least a bit of relief to two industries that have been particularly hard hit during the pandemic. The application for this $12 million grant program closes today at 11.59 p.m. So for owners and operators of gyms and restaurants, if you have not yet applied, please do so before midnight. Awards will be made based on eligibility and alignment with program priorities. So it's not too late. Grant awards are estimated to be up to $15,000 per business. Businesses can apply online at phila.gov forward slash RGRP. That's phila.gov forward slash RGRP. On that site, we also have a list of organizations that can help businesses fill out the application, including translation and technological assistance. However, most of these community organizations are only available during normal business hours. So you need to reach out soon if you need assistance applying before the deadline. And now Dr. Farley has a couple of other important announcements. Thank you, Mayor. Our COVID case counts are falling in Philadelphia. I'll update you on the epidemic, on our vaccine program, and our restrictions. First, the numbers. Since this time yesterday, we've identified 473 new cases of coronavirus infection in Philadelphia residents confirmed by the PCR test, bringing us to a total confirmed case count of 109,183 since the beginning of the epidemic, and an additional 99 new probable cases diagnosed by the rapid antigen test. Now, for the past week that ended on February 6th, we averaged 303 cases per day. That's the PCR test and the antigen test combined. So far, we expect more to come in later. And of those people tested, 6.2% of the tests were positive. Now, for comparison, the week before, uh, we averaged 371 cases per day and 6.3% of the tests were positive. So our case counts are still high and we still need to take precautions. But it's nice to still see that continued downward trend. As far as deaths, we have Eight new deaths identified today, bringing us a total of 2,955 since the beginning of the epidemic. Now, we peaked at somewhat over 100 deaths per week in late December, 
And in January, we're averaging about 60 to 80 deaths per week. That number has generally been falling with the declining case counts. Now, let me move on to vaccination. First, let me just say, I realize that many people want this vaccine. And I'm really glad that they do want this vaccine. But also, I know that many people continue to be frustrated that they can't find a way to get it. Uh, because of the limits on doses and because of our vaccination capacity, that is the, the situation we're in right now when we are working on all that. Our, we have three guiding principles as we go forward here. First, to get the vaccine out as fast as possible to people. Second, to do it in a way that saves the most lives to those people whose vaccination would prevent the most serious infection. And third, to do it with racial equity. We have more work to do in all three of those areas, but we are making progress. First, let me talk about our vaccine supply. We continue to have limited uh, vaccine supply, but there's some moves in the positive direction here. This week, we're receiving 10,700 doses of the Pfizer vaccine, and our Moderna vaccine uh, allocation increased to 14,400 from a little more than 10,000 before. In addition to that, there's a new federal pharmacy partnership that is bringing in an additional 4,900 doses of Moderna vaccine to Rite Aid pharmacies specifically. Now that's welcome, those increases are great, but remember we have 1.2 million adults in the city of Philadelphia, so it's still gonna be many months before everyone has an opportunity to get vaccinated. Now also off not too far in the future, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is likely to be approved. And the best estimates are that it may be shipped to Philadelphia around March 1st. And this vaccine has a couple of major advantages. It's only a single dose rather than two doses and it can be kept in a refrigerator. It doesn't need to be frozen. However, it is somewhat less effective than the other vaccines. Uh, the numbers that come out of the press release from the companies, we haven't seen the studies yet, are that it's 72% effective at preventing infection, but it's 85% effective in preventing severe disease, which is more important. Now, as vaccines go, that's still a very good vaccine. I would highly recommend people get the vaccine if they have the opportunity, uh, but it is not quite as good as the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines that we're giving right now. Now, initially, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will come to us in very limited doses. Based on what I've heard at the national level, I'll estimate that our initial allocation may be between 5,000 and 10,000 doses only. And it's unclear how, we'll get, how many doses we'll get after that. But still, this is one more weapon in this battle, and that's very much welcome. Let me talk about how we're doing with the administration of our vaccines. As of this past Sunday uh, night, we reported vaccinations in 121,250 people for their first doses. And 50,000 people of those have received their second doses. So far, most of those people who have been vaccinated are healthcare workers. Now, the other people who are eligible in phase 1A are people who live uh, in, in uh, nursing facilities or, or facilities like that. So there are teams from the pharmacies that have visited 83 nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and personal care homes. And 42 of those sites now have had two visits and then delivered 17,600 doses. So we are making real progress amongst the people who are clearly the most vulnerable for serious, serious disease. So we're now in phase 1B, as we said before, and we'll be in this phase for many weeks. That includes people who are frontline essential workers, and we're continuing to vaccinate our first responders, people in the jail, uh, service providers who work with vulnerable populations, and soon transit workers. Uh, people also eligible now are people who live and work in congregate settings like behavioral health facilities, people over the age of 75, and people who have high-risk medical conditions, especially those with cancer, chronic kidney disease, organ transplant, and diabetes. So how's the vaccine being av made available now? For hospitals, they are inviting patients to their facilities who meet those criteria, who are over the age of 75 or chronic medical conditions, and they're bringing them into their clinics to be vaccinated. Likewise, the federally qualified health centers and other clinics like that are inviting their patients in to be vaccinated. That started out fairly slowly, but that should increase this week. Then we have mobile teams that are going out primarily to behavioral health facilities to vaccinate people in those facilities. Then one area that's growing uh, fairly substantially is pharmacies. We now have ShopRite, three locations, and Walgreens with 11 locations, and Rite Aid uh, offering vaccination. The Rite Aid currently has 26 locations, and that will be expanding to 77 locations this weekend. Now, the eligibility for these pharmacies is going to be age 75 or older. For Rite Aid, they're still working on healthcare workers, but they'll be shifting to age 75 this weekend. So we're really trying to target these pharmacies for those people who are elderly, who are extraordinarily high risk. So we're asking people, if you're under the age of 75, please don't sign up for a vaccine at a pharmacy. The systems won't easily screen you out, but that's not what this is about. If you do go there and you're younger, 
and you're basically preventing somebody else who is over the age of 75 from being vaccinated. Those are the pharmacies that will have a vaccine this week. More pharmacies will be announced in the future. Then in addition to that, we have our mass clinics. Now there are mass clinics run by the health department at the convention center. This past week, we've been doing the second dose clinics for people who received their first dose from Philly fighting COVID. In the last week, we vaccinated more than 2,500 people. That was Tuesday through Saturday. And this week, from the 9th through the 13th, we'll be vaccinating approximately 4,400 people. Then there will be an increasing number of mass clinics that are run by hospitals. The first one to talk about today is one run by uh, a combination of Mercy and the Penn Medicine System. They're going to be the Church of Christian Compassion this Saturday, February 13th. It's a single cl clinic to uh, vaccinate people in one particular um, community. Uh, and but th So that's not the overall citywide strategy. But that's just one of many mass clinics I hope that you'll be seeing more about in the future. There are more to come on that. And then there are mass clinics run by the Black Doctors COVID Consortium, and I hope more organizations in the future. In addition to that, the health department will be doing an ongoing series of mass clinics beginning the week of February 22nd. Now there are three sites that have been chosen so, forth, so far to run those clinics. The Community Academy of Philadelphia Charter School, 1100 East Erie Avenue is one. Then the Martin Luther King Older Adult Center in North Philadelphia at 2100 Cecil B. Moore Avenue is a second. And the University of the Sciences in West Philadelphia, 730 West, 730 South, 43rd Street is the third. Now, within the next week, we'll get back to you with more specific dates uh, about what, when the, the clinics are going to be at each of those different locations. And if people are interested in those uh, participating and in, in getting vaccinated at those clinics or any clinics, they should go to our vaccine interest signup form. And people who are on that form uh, who meet our phase 1B criteria, uh, that's a very large list, but some of them will be invited to those clinics to be vaccinated. We will be emailing people and calling those people to invite them to sign up for those appointments. Then, as the mayor said, uh, we are very pleased today to uh, talk about the partnership with uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or CHOP, to, to vaccinate teachers, support staff, and child care staff. I really want to thank them for doing that. Now, there are many details to be worked out, but here's the current plan. The vaccines will be offered at the Roberts Center on the CHOP campus, plus six different school-based locations. The schools uh, will provide a list of names of their staff to CHOP. Uh, and then at the same time, the schools will notify their staff and how they can contact CHOP to schedule an appointment. Uh, CHOP is still working about how they will invite childcare staff, but childcare staff are part of the same plan. This whole plan will start the week of February 22nd. And the goal is to complete it over the course of eight weeks. There's a large number of people involved. We can't guarantee they'll meet that goal, but that's the goal. So what should people do who want to get this vaccine? Uh, well, just remind people, if you believe you're eligible because of your job, because you believe you're an essential worker, talk to your employer. And if you think you're eligible because you have a medical condition that qualifies you or the, you're over the age of 75, check the clinic where you receive your medical care or the health system where you receive your medical care. Or if you are over the age of 75, you can check with the pharmacies that I mentioned earlier. And if you're anyone else or you're not sure, then put your name into our database www.phila.gov slash vaccine interest. That's www.phila.gov slash vaccine interest, one word. Uh, and we'll notify you when opportunities arise. But just to warn you, if you're young and healthy, expect to wait. This is going to be a long process. Then uh, I also can announce today we have a new way for organizations to communicate to us about their interest to have their workers vaccinated. This would be for employers of essential workers. We have a website that's starting uh, today www.phila.gov slash business vaccine. That's www.phila.gov slash business vaccine. This is for an employer of any size, not just a for-profit business. Uh, and it's about letting you know how many employees you have that you think may be eligible because they're essential workers. And then as opportunities come up to vaccinate those people, we will notify the person who has provided that information on our website. Now let me move to our safer at home restrictions. Um, as you know, on January 16th, we backed off cautiously in our restrictions. We allowed indoor dining at restaurants with a maximum seating capacity of 25%. Now we know that outdoor dining is safer than indoor dining because of the much better ventilation that you get outdoors. So what we've done since that time is we've worked with the restaurants to establish standards for ventilation that would increase that ventilation indoors and then allow restaurants to have an increased capacity indoors. 
And the idea is if the restaurants can document that they have this excellent ventilation, that they can increase their capacity from 25% to 50%. So here are the standards. I'll just give you the details of them here, but more is on our website. If they have a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system or HVAC system, they need to have the percent of outdoor air that is mixed in that system be greater than 20%. They need to have a filter on that system that has a grade of that's MERV of 11 or greater. That's MERV 11 or greater. And that system needs to deliver 15 or more air changes per hour. That's to say the air turns over on average every four minutes or less. Now, if they don't have an HVAC system, they can still do this. What they need to do is they need to put fans in the windows. And we're giving them guidance on how they can do that. And with using those fans, they can just meet the same goal of the more than 15 air changes per hour. Now, there's a form on our website being posted today in our guidance section for restaurants on how to apply. It's a fairly simple form for restaurants to complete. They do need to have someone to measure the airflow of their system, but it's not that complicated. An HVAC te technician can do it or other people can do it. Uh, we, if people send in those forms, we will review them and we will respond with a goal of responding to restaurants within 72 hours of our having received those forms. Uh, and then based upon what's represented to us on those forms, we will approve restaurants who have met the standards. And if they meet the standards, then they can immediately go to the 50% capacity. This goes into effect on this Friday, uh, February 12th. Now I should note here uh, that we are breaking new ground. I'm, we're not aware of other locations that have done this, but we do think this is a way to try to have restaurants uh, get back on their feet uh, economically and provide service to customers while also doing it safely. We're trying to come up with that balance. Consider what we're doing here with these new standards, sort of version 1.0. Uh, we're gonna learn from this. I'm sure there'll be uh, glitches with it, but as we, uh, as we learn from this, we may need to adjust. Uh, but we do, this is a, an attempt to really try to meet the, the, the business goals and the opportunity to get people back to work while also doing it safely. Uh, now, these are the changes we're making to our restrictions today with the restaurants. But if case rates continue to fall, we will be making others as well. I should say, though, that we continue to not allow indoor catered events or indoor social gatherings of any size because these are the primary way that the virus spreads between households right now. People get together indoors without masks. It's a very high risk situation. So what should people now do now? Uh, remember the vaccine, as much as we're excited that it's here, will not help us get through this winter wave. There's simply not enough available. We need to keep up our masks and need to keep up our distancing for some time to come. No indoor gatherings, no parties, no inviting friends over, no relatives over, no sleepovers for the kids. If you do get together with others, do it outside while wearing masks. The same precautions are true even after you've been vaccinated. Even after you've been vaccinated, you don't want to spread this infection. More information on all that I talked about is at our website, www.phila.gov COVID. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dr. Farley. And as I mentioned earlier, we are going to have Armando's translation of the mayor's and Dr. Farley's remarks at the end at uh, 2 p.m. so that we have enough time to get to your questions on all of these announcements. And of course, today we are again joined by Managing Director Tumar Alexander. Because of limited time, only one representative from each media outlet is permitted to ask questions in the first round. Reporters are asked to limit their questions to three or fewer. And we are limiting the first round of questions to the topic of COVID-19. If there's time, we'll do a second round and then potentially questions on other topics. So if your hand is raised now and it is not on COVID-19, please lower it and we'll let you know when we open it up to broader topics. And with that, let's go first to Mitch Blocker of NBC10. Mitch. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Farley, uh, regarding teachers and vaccinations, I want to ask you, some teachers are concerned about going back to school before being fully vaccinated or having the immunity take effect, what do you suggest they do? You know, there have been a number of schools that have been open throughout all of this without any vaccination. And those schools in general have done very well. We have had some spread in schools, but it's been pretty small. I think that people can uh, prevent spread in schools if they follow safety precautions. So I don't think that vaccination is necessary for schools to be open. And I think teachers should go to school to work uh, and provide our children education, even if they don't have the vaccine yet. Uh, and uh, this program will try to get the vaccine to them as quickly as possible. But if we wait until every teacher is vaccinated to open up school, uh, get kids back, 
uh, we may miss the entire school year. But we do we do understand the level of concern that teachers and everybody has. Frontline workers have been having this concern since you know back in March of 2020. So we want to move quickly with CHOP uh, and some of our other resources to get as many vaccinated as possible. Uh, you know, everybody's on edge. Everybody wants their vaccine. Uh, you know, I signed up for one myself. I don't know when that'll be. Uh, and I understand, the, you know, the stress. Uh, so we're going to work with CHOP to try to get that done. Uh, but and also work with uh, the district and some of our construction trades folks to try to help get the buildings to a point in a uh, a point where uh, we agree they're all safe. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and Dr. Farley, last week, I know you asked local hospitals to release their extra doses. Now that seems to be happening. How many extra doses or how many, how many stored up doses do hospitals have for these clinics? And, and how have you reallocated where you send vaccine because of these new vaccination sites? Uh, well, you know, most of the vaccine that is coming in this week is going to places other than hospitals. Uh, even though the hospitals are stepping up their vaccination, they had enough in storage that other places could get it. So more doses are going this week to uh, federally qualified health centers and other, uh, other clinics. More doses are going to pharmacies uh, and then doses are going to these mass clinics. Uh, and so we're gonna continue to adjust and see uh, how quickly all these organizations are vaccinating people. And uh, as well as the demographics of people that are vaccinated and channel the doses accordingly. It, but is there is there an overflow supply in hospitals right now? You know, there is vaccine stored um, in hospitals and clinics and pharmacies. There is a certain inventory uh, throughout the system. Uh, it's more than I'd like it to be. I like, you know, every dose to be in people's arms. Uh, but it was definitely enough in the, the hospitals that we felt that this week they didn't need to have any doses that we could channel it to other other sites. But also in my, in my discussion with hospitals, um, you know, a, a lot of those will be used for their current uh, patients who have underlying conditions. So they'll be scheduled to get in uh, cancer patients and others. So there's a need for them to have some, some bit of, um, of stock in order to uh, vaccinate those folks. And, and in addition to the second doses, right? People that they've already vaccinated, they need to make sure there's enough when they come back for the second doses. But we're gonna have to just be as, you know, monitoring this as close as we can to try to, to match the, the rate at which they administer with the doses that come in. And let me ask you one, one, one quick question about the mutations. Have you seen any sign that any of these COVID mutations are, are taking hold in the city? And do you think <coughs> vaccinations at some point will outpace the mutations ability to infect? You know, I, from what I, we know in the city that some of the, uh, the new variants have been identified. So we know that they're here in the city. Uh, it's unclear to us how fraction of the uh, viruses that are circulating there have these variants. I am concerned about uh, some of the stories that came out of South Africa this week that suggested that uh, some of the vaccines were less effective or the AstraZeneca vaccine was ineffective against some of the variants there. Uh, so I am concerned about that. I, I think that's something we need to watch closely. I, I would say, let's review this. All the vaccines we're using now is kind of version 1.0 of the vaccines. And we may very well need future versions of the vaccines. We may need to be all vaccinated once a year as the virus continues to change. Uh, so this is all changing very rapidly. We're, I don't believe we are seeing this as a problem in Philadelphia now, but it's definitely a concern over the longer term. All right. Thank you, Mitch. Let's go to Jeff Cole of Fox 29. Jeff, you're up. Hi, folks. First, uh, for uh, Dr. Farley, I just want to go back to the teachers one more uh, time, Dr. Farley. On yes. Friday, uh, Jerry Jordan, the union president, said to his uh, pre-K through second grade teachers, you uh, do not go back to the schools. We don't believe they're safe. We obviously know that uh, most uh, teachers have not been vaccinated. It seems to me from your early answer, you believe Philadelphia schools are safe for teachers to return to without being vaccinated. Is that correct? That is correct, right? If they follow our safety precautions, and you know, there's a number of schools in the city, parochial schools uh, and, and some charter schools and independent schools that have been open and have done quite well. Yeah, uh, question uh, for the mayor. Mayor, can you, yes, tell us, can you tell us any more about this third party, whether we're gonna get a report out of them soon? And if the third party says, I think these schools are safe, as Dr. Farley just said, do you think Jerry Jordan has an obligation to send his teachers back into buildings here? Well, we have a mediator for a reason. The mediator is working. 
Uh, we realized that the mediator wouldn't be prepared uh, as of um, this past Monday with the, with the results or decision. So we decided it would be better not to, to force the teachers into school until the mediator rules. However, the mediator rules, we will abide by that and try to get as much work done as, as we are now, getting as much work done as possible. I'm not gonna comment on Jerry Jordan's style of leadership. He's been elected numerous times to his union and he leads them well as co according to the people that matter and that's the teachers. So we're, 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 we're trying to be friends and, uh, and deal with everybody on an equal basis. Uh, there's no reason to create controversy uh, when we have enough controversy over COVID uh, and the health results, the health effects of it since March. So we're working with everybody to get it done. We'll see what the mediator says. We have, uh, we have spoken with members of the construction trades, especially the sheet metal workers uh, nationally and locally. Uh, and uh, we're, we're willing to do everything we can to get everybody a level of comfort. Uh, one more mayor and I have three questions. So this is my last one. Um, you know, you've said that you believe young, particularly young students need to be back into classrooms. And clearly yes. the reporting nationally has been that, that kids on certain levels, particularly young kids are suffering. Yet, um, Dr. Farley said he believes the buildings are safe. Dr. Height said he thinks the buildings are safe and he wanted folks back Monday. And you said, no, nah, you don't have to go back. Didn't you undercut Height's mandate? No, I think, I think it's, you don't have to go back. You're not going to be able to force people to go to work. I mean, especially in this environment, what we're going to do, we're going to send the police out to pick them up and take them to the classroom. So, it's, I mean, but it's so safe. The classrooms are we, safe. Dr. We agreed. Hyde. We agreed to do a mediator, which we're doing. That's the process we're following. In the meantime, we're getting chopped to vaccinate people, I believe, starting on the 22nd. I'll try to get everybody a level of comfort and not do it, do it as in a contentious way. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Let's go to David Melandra of Philly Sports Network. My question is for Dr. Farley. During the Super Bowl pregame show, President Biden said that the NFL offered up all 32 NFL stadiums. Have you talked to the Eagles about the plan for the like mass vaccination unit? If not, like a financial field, then would you use any other stadium? Yeah, you know, I have not talked directly with the Eagles, but I know the Eagles have been great partners through this. And I would imagine that if we wanted to have a mass clinic at the stadium, that they would offer up that facility. Uh, I don't think that that's the best way to get a uh, vaccine available right now. The, uh, we have a limited number of doses. If we ran a mass clinic down there, we would be vaccinating more people from New Jersey or Delaware uh, than we would from the city of Philadelphia. And we only are given doses appropriate to the population of the city of Philadelphia. So having something that's more centrally location, located to people who are in Philadelphia neighborhoods and the stadiums and accessible to people who don't have cars, is more important to us right now. Now that may be different in the future uh, when we have more vaccine available, but at the moment we're not uh, pursuing that. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, David. Let's go now to Sean Walsh of The Inquirer. Thanks very much. A um, couple of my questions got asked, but um, Dr. Farley, will the city be, with the new ventilation rules for restaurants, will the city be verifying um, that restaurants have done this or, or just kind of accepting the form and, uh, or, or alternatively, could they do follow-up inspections later and that type of thing? Yeah, it's the latter, so that we will at first, just accept the information they've given to us on the form. They have to attest that this, they've done a real measurement and that have met the standards. But then when we do our routine inspections or inspections on complaint, uh, if they're not in compliance, then they may get a violation for that. On complaint, okay. Uh, wait, did you say on complaint or on like a random inspection? Either one. So we do routine inspections on a random basis where everyone gets at least one inspection per year. But we also will inspect if there's a complaint by anybody about any problem with that restaurant. Uh, and if we're doing a, a complaint-based inspection, then we would do this measurement. Thanks. Um, and Mayor Kenny, uh, on the schools issue, um, if the mediator does say schools can reopen as, as the district is trying to, ha what can you do to convince parents or teachers um, that this is safe given the sort of disagreement right now? Continuing to make improvements to the school safety as obviously we've been working over this period of time on lead and asbestos, uh, we will be taking um, advice from again experts in in air purification or air handling uh, to to make those changes uh, and look everybody as I said from the beginning um, everybody's on edge everybody's stressed out everybody wants a vaccine everybody wants to be proof or uh, positive that they're not going to get it uh, and that's what's created all this and what's really created it all is having an administration before this one uh, in Washington that was not prepared for anything. So I guess I said before, from PPE to testing, 
to vaccine availability to uh, distribution of vaccine. They failed miserably in every, every, every segment and we're picking up the pieces and I think we're doing a good job and we're trying to move forward. So we'll see what the mediator says and we'll make the correct, we'll make the, the correct improvements and uh, hopefully we can have a decent end of the school year. Given, last question is, given what we're hearing about the outcomes for students not being in school, uh, especially their mental health and their learning progress, do you wish in retrospect that the district had reopened or taken the steps it's taken now earlier in the school year? I mean, there's lots of things, I mean, look, there's, there's lots of things going on in the city, lots of things going on in the country, uh, and we're moving as fast as we can. And um, what, all I'm saying is we're trying to get people in a position where they feel safe, where parents feel safe about their kids, and where kids can back, come back to school. So I can't speculate on what should have or could have or would have been done. Thanks. All right, thank you, Sean. Let's go now to Maggie Kent of 6ABC. and the mayor. Um, I understand that there are strict guidelines now for restaurants to be able to open and have people inside. Will those same airflow guidelines be applicable to our school buildings since kids are there for eight hours a day? So the uh, just to be clear, the standards for restaurants are if they want to have an enhanced capacity. Any restaurant in Philadelphia right now can open up at 25 percent capacity. But if they want to go to 50% capacity, then they have to meet these enhanced, enhanced ventilation standards. Uh, a restaurant is different from a school. Uh, a restaurant is particularly high risk because people are not wearing masks because they're eating. Uh, in classrooms, we want the teachers and the students to be wearing masks the entire time. So the risk should be substantially less there. I think ventilation is a good thing. I know that the, the school district is moving to improve ventilation with things like fans as well as their HVAC systems. I think that's a good thing, but uh, they should not have to meet these enhanced restaurant standards in order for them to reopen the schools. Okay. Just to follow up on that, are kids going to be having the breakfast and lunches there? Now, the, each school has a different system for where they're actually eating. Uh, I don't have the details on that, whether they can do it in the classroom or elsewhere. Okay. And then uh, follow up to the frustrations that you had been talking about earlier with vaccinations. Uh, Pennsylvanians, Philadelphians, who are seeing people in Jersey and Delaware right over the border getting their um, appointments and vaccinations. What's your response to the frustrations that you're hearing? What do you need to see um, either from the state or federal level, aside from more doses that could be helpful? I mean, PA doesn't have a statewide registry either, whereas our neighbors do as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to see how the registry works elsewhere. You know, our system for distribution of these vaccines has many, many different sorts of providers. Uh, hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, each one has their own information systems. I'm not quite sure how it could be scheduled across multiple providers. Kind of like when you schedule a doctor's appointment in general, you don't go to one central number and have a schedule wherever you're going, you go to the specific doctor's office. So I think it would be hard to do a central registry. Um, I think you know everyone in the country is frustrated right now with the vaccine rollout. Let's just face that. Uh, partly that's just, I think largely it's because there's not enough doses of vaccine. Uh, but also, this is a new program uh, where everybody wants to be vaccinated at once, and uh, having all the providers develop their systems to deliver that vaccine is something which doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and so, you know, we're we're going to work through our, our problems as as quickly as we can. The other places are facing their own problems, uh, and uh, and you know, nobody's going to be happy until we get over the hump where the people most eager have been vaccinated. I think we'll be there uh, in a few weeks. Uh, but during that time, it's just going to be tough for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Let's go to Brian Mendoza of Telemundo. Brian, you're up, and we do have Armando here for you. Thank you so much for that. Um, hola, buenas tardes, Armando. La primera pregunta es si el llamado eh, para vacunar a los maestros es en respuesta a las protestas que realizaron ayer. Y si eso es así, ¿por qué no tener un plan para vacunarlos antes de tiempo si es que los queremos que regresen a las aulas de las escuelas? Mando, you have to unmute, please. The question is whether the plan to vaccinate teachers is in response to the protests that were had yesterday. And if that's the case, what wasn't there a plan to have the teachers be vaccinated before their return to the classrooms? Now, the plan to vaccinate teachers was not in response to the protests yesterday. The 
you know, we have our uh, frontline essential workers on a priority ranking. Uh, there's a table there. Uh, it starts with first responders and works on down the list. Teachers are about halfway down the list. We are getting close to that. And so this is, you know, as we, we knew as we approached that, we needed a plan. And so uh, we would talk to, to CHOP about doing this. And so now we have enough in place to, to discuss that. So that was just a coincidence. We do want the teachers to be vaccinated as soon as possible to address any fears that they have about um, coming back to the classroom. Uh, but there was uh, not, not, nothing prompted this in the past 48 hours. La respuesta del comisionado Farley es que tenemos un plan de vacunación que ya estaba instaurado y tenemos la prioridad para aquellos socorristas de primera línea que tenían la prioridad y los pues, maestros se encontraban en la mitad más o menos de esa lista de prioridades. Este el acercamiento que teníamos en nuestro plan y afortunadamente CHOP, el Hospital de Niños de Filadelfia, accedió a ayudarnos con esta parte del plan. Ha sido entonces una coincidencia. Obviamente queremos que todos los maestros estén vacunados lo antes posible para que puedan volver a las aulas sin temores. Pero esto no se debe a nada que haya sucedido coincidentalmente en las últimas 48 horas, Brian. Listo. La segunda eh, pregunta, Armando, es el doctor Farley mencionó que no se tiene ningún plan para usar los estadios como, por ejemplo, el Lincoln Financial Center para hacer una, un centro de vacunación masivo. Pero... Este, ¿Se tiene algún plan por si acaso esto es necesario así de la noche a la mañana para tener un centro eh, de vacunación tan amplio como se lo podría tener en el, uh, en el estadio? The second question is also for Dr. Farley. Dr. Farley, we know that there's no plans to have a center of vaccination be put in stadiums such as the Lincoln Field Center, but is there a mass vaccination plan in place that would make it uh, possible to use such a stadium and others, should it become necessary overnight to have a mass vaccination center in place? Well, we have mass vaccination clinics that we, uh, I talked about earlier today uh, that we're gonna be having in different neighborhoods across the city. We are continuing to work on plans for other mass vaccination clinics. And so there will be, you know, at some point likely to have others announced in other locations across the city, but. Uh, I don't have anything else to announce right now. Nosotros ya contamos con centros de acceso masivos en diferentes barrios de la ciudad y tenemos planes para expandir estos locales de acceso para la vacunación en masa. Por el momento no estamos listos para revelar ninguna otra ubicación fuera de las que ya tenemos. Gracias, Brian. Listo. Y la última pregunta es, um, hay muchos en la comunidad indocumentada, la comunidad inmigrante que tienen una preocupación en cuanto a registrarse para recibir la vacuna, ya que tienen miedo que ICE esté en estas ubicaciones. ¿Qué se les puede decir o cómo se le puede reiterar a la comunidad de que eh, van a estar seguros si van o se si atienden a, a que se les eh, administre la vacuna? My third question has to deal with the undocumented immigrant community. Uh, who's uh, holding fears of signing up for vaccination, fearing that ICE may be around, and what would the city say and what would be the message to reiterate to these communities in regards to their safety as them uh, as they sign up for vaccination? Uh, two messages. Number one, we really want to be vaccinated for your health and the health of the community. Number two, uh, we do not and will not share your name with ICE. The data that's in our database does not get shared with the federal government at all, in particular with ICE. Tenemos dos mensajes para la comunidad inmigrante indocumentada. El primer mensaje es que queremos que se vacune por su propia salud y por la salud de toda la comunidad. Y el segundo mensaje es que nosotros no estamos compartiendo ni vamos a compartir la información que tenemos de ustedes con el gobierno federal y particularmente con ICE, de manera que pueden confiar en un proceso de vacunación seguro. Gracias. Gracias, Armando. Gracias, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Armando. Let's go now to Martin Pratt of Philly YBN. This first question is for, I don't know if uh, Tumar or uh, the mayor wants to take it. Uh, garbage pickup in South Philly, um, that was Monday and Tuesday from last week, where it's been picked up. Is there a time frame to expect it to be picked up this week? Hey, Martin, afternoon. 
Um, I think we're a little behind just catching up, but there, the folks should keep their trash out. It will be picked up this week. And Thank likely you. that'll happen Monday and Tuesday. Uh, pickups will happen. Anything that's left over happened today going into tomorrow morning. Just Thank a you. reminder, Martin, we're focused on uh, COVID now for this first round. Do you have other COVID-related questions? Yes, I do. Uh, this is for Dr. Farley. Dr. Farley, you talked about the restaurant purification. Have you looked at the uh, what's called stat air purifiers? Are there a specific type of purification that you're talking about? Or uh, if a restaurant tour picks up a purifier that right now the industry is saying can help kill the pathogen, uh, will they be penalized or not penalized for following exactly what direction they decide to go over what you said? Yeah, you know, I know that there's a lot of systems and products that are being sold to restaurants as making it safer. Uh, but we looked yeah. into this and consulted with industrial hygienists. We think that our standards are the way to go rather than some, rather than some of the, the, um, the uh, I'm sorry. So uh, if people want to do something in addition to our standards, we have no problem with that. Uh, but it's really moving a lot of air through those uh, 15 air changes per hour and then moving in with a good mix of outdoor air and a good filter is what we think is going to make the most difference. Okay. Thank you. I'm done. All right. Thank you, Martin. Let's go now to Johan Calhoun of Chalkbeat. Johan, you're up. Thank you. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Farley and breaking down the rollout. You said hospitals would con contact schools and then by grade. What can you tell us more about the logistics of, of that the rollout? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't give you more details than that other than this is something that CHOP is going to work out with the school systems that they're dealing with. School systems have the names of their uh, teachers and other staff, uh, and CHOP will essentially set it up in their uh, electronic records, and then the teachers will contact CHOP and schedule a specific appointment. Okay, uh, how many people do you estimate work in district, private schools, childcare facilities, and how are they going to fit in this priority system with the teachers? And that question is for Dr. Farley. So the, the offering the vaccine to teachers and to childcare workers is gonna take place more or less at the same time. Uh, so it's not gonna be one person and the other another time. We have a more complete list of teachers than childcare workers, uh, but we're, they're working on mechanisms to get the uh, to get the message to, to childcare workers for them to have that opportunity. Um, and uh, we don't have precise numbers on it, and we also don't know how many of these uh, workers will want to be vaccinated. We know many times people, uh, although many people desperately want the vaccine, we have many others who don't. Uh, and so it's certainly. Over the 10,000, maybe 20,000 people ultimately will, will be vaccinated, but there'll be more than that who will be offered the vaccine. Okay, this is for uh, the mayor and ultimately for the mayor and for Dr. Farley to, to answer. Uh, mayor Kenny, how will the president's plan help with matters with the teachers? And I, I'm not sure if you quite said this, but do you still expect school to open February 22nd? May, are you uh, are you able to unmute there? You're muted. We do we do expect school to open this twenty second, and simultaneously with the beginning of the vaccination of teachers and other other school workers. Uh, and I, I don't know what which plan are you talking about with the president? Uh, Biden's plan. Which 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 segment of it? What part of it? Oh, let's see here. I expect to have more vaccines sooner than later, see, sooner than later, and certainly sooner than the Trump administration would have provided. Uh, but um, that's what we really need right now is more vaccines. Uh, if if I could just say that what, what the president has said is that he will work hard to increase the number of doses of vaccine that we'll receive. And also he's uh, talked about plans to have uh, federally supported mass vaccination sites. And we're enthusiastic about both, uh, but there's no definitive plans for either right now. So the number of vaccines that you plan on getting from the White House, do you think that's going to help you prioritize with the teachers? The more vaccines we have, the faster we're going to get through and vaccinating everybody. Okay, a quick question for both of you. Uh, let me get your thoughts on this photo of the fans that has gone about. Is that photo hype or is it valid concern? I haven't seen the photo, so I, I can't answer the question. 
question. I haven't seen the photo either. What is it of? Just it's fans? A photo, it's a photo of um, plastic temporary fans that you can possibly get at, at a dollar store and they are connected to wooden planks. And apparently these fans are gonna be used against uh, the walls or windows of classrooms um, and used as like an air filtration um, system um, in which air is coming in and out of the classroom. So uh, I attended many of the protests yesterday and many of the signs that I saw um, had the picture of this the photo of this fan. And so, Johan, uh, what I suggest is if you could email that photo to the press account um, and we can check uh, with the school district on uh, whether or not there's any uh, veracity uh, to, to that to that claim. Doc, doctor, could you at least talk about fans? Because they seem to be denegraded uh, yeah, on so a regular basis, and I think they're being short-sighted. But again, so, well, I could just talk about the general issue, and that is the, the goal is, is to improve ventilation in the same way that we're improving ventilation at restaurants. Uh, and one of the things we've learned is that a very simple fan in the window can make a big difference in how much ventilation you have in that room. So that's why one of the options for the restaurants to meet our standards is to put fans in the windows. Uh, and so this is what the school district has proposed in some of these older buildings where they really can't upgrade the HVAC system. And I think that that is a great solution to a, a, a real problem where we want to increase the ventilation and we need to move quickly. Uh, so I haven't seen the picture, but the general concept makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. I'm emailing you the photo now. Great. Thank you, Johan. Let's go to Claudia Lauer of the Associated Press. Claudia, could you unmute? Sorry. Thank you. Um, I just had a brief couple of questions. I, I know that 1B includes first responders. I was wondering if, if there's any um, information that you guys have heard about whether or not police and firefighters are, are taking advantage of the of the vaccine being offered to them, or if you're getting any hint that there's a resistance, um, if the, the departments are offering incentives that you know of? Uh, police and fire are definitely getting vaccinated. There's a certain number being vaccinated every week. I can't give you numbers on what percentage of their uh, force are agreeing to be vaccinated. No one's being required to be vaccinated, but they're definitely being vaccinated. Okay, so you've seen the, a, a positive response from, from a lot of the, the, I guess a lot is a hard thing, but you've, you've seen a positive response so far. We know that many people have been vaccinated every week, yes. Great, thank you. Claudia, is that it? Yep, that's it, thank you. Let's go to Jack Tomzik of the Metro. Thanks for taking my question. Um, Dr. Farley, uh, this is about the pharmacies, and I know you said they're gonna be mostly for 75 and older. So is that gonna be through the vaccine interest form or is that something where older residents should be contacting these pharmacies now and calling around to see you know, who has openings? You know, they, they can do either. Uh, the, uh, many of these, uh, it's just opening up and many of these links get um, overwhelmed immediately. And, and so it may be somewhat difficult either way, uh, but uh, it, you know, they can certainly contact the, the pharmacies and see if they get an appointment or they can uh, get it in our vaccine interest form and we'll route it. And uh, I think you mentioned with the CHOP partnership that the CHOP's going to be offering it at one of their buildings and six other sites. Do you have those sites? No, I, we don't have that information now. I don't think they've been decided yet. Okay. And uh, with the three sites for the health department's mass vaccination site, are, there, are they going to be um, returning locations or recurring clinics there, or is it just going to be one-time clinics there? Likely they'll be recurring. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jack. Let's now go to our heinous Figueroa of Univision. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. You hear me? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Mayor, Dr. Farley, good afternoon. Um, my question gonna be for both. Um, pero voy a necesitar, Armando, que me traduzcas, por favor. Uh, la primera pregunta es sobre, para, puede ser para el alcalde y también el Dr. Farley, Uh, ayer vimos una protesta de maestros frente al distrito escolar porque no se sienten seguros de entrar a las escuelas sin ser vacunados. Ahora con la incorporación del hospital de niños para este proceso, ¿creen que será el fin, que podría ser el fin del conflicto actual sobre justamente esta preocupación de los maestros? Yes, this is a question that can go both for Mayor and Dr. Farley. Yesterday we've seen some protests of teachers in front of the school district building 
because they don't feel safe about coming back to the classrooms. Now that there is a program in set in place with CHOP to have them vaccinated, do you think this will be the end of this protest from teachers? I mean, certainly people, organized labor, individual indiv individual people have a right to protest any time for any reason about any issue. Uh, teachers are organized and they're articulate and they uh, have a definite opinion about things, whether it's this particular program or whether it's uh, curriculum or uh, plant conditions in the school and they have a right to express those opinions. So do I think it will stop protests? No, I think that there'll be other issues in a very old school district that's underfunded by the state. Uh, and um, yeah, we're gonna continue to have issues that pop up and we're gonna work together with them uh, to, to rectify those issues. El alcalde nos responde de que eh, el, los trabajadores organizados y la gente en general cuenta con el derecho de protesta y obviamente los maestros son gente organizada y son gente que articula sus quejas de una forma vocal. Por lo tanto, ya sea con este programa de vacunación o con otras cosas, van a continuar estas propuestas o este proceso de diálogo no se va a detener, especialmente cuando contamos con un distrito escolar antiguo que no cuenta con los fondos necesarios para satisfacer todas sus necesidades. Si no sea este tema, va a ser otro tema. Los maestros van a continuar protestando probablemente como temas de currículo, no solamente la vacuna, pero nosotros vamos a trabajar juntos con ellos, reconociendo su derecho de protestar y comunicarse. Gracias. Okay, gracias. Eh, mi próxima pregunta será para el doctor Farley. Y es que... Cerca del 3% de personas vacunadas en la ciudad son hispanas. Eso nos lo dijo un portavoz de, del Departamento de Salud y, y atribuye que esto principalmente es a que la mayoría están siendo administradas, la mayoría de las vacunas están siendo administradas en hospitales. ¿Está el departamento actualmente conversando con estos centros de salud que sirven a los hispanos? ¿Cuál sería el estatus de estas conversaciones y cuál sería la planificación para que los hispanos tengan acceso a las vacunas? About this is a question for Dr. Farley mostly. About 3% of the people vaccinated in the city are Hispanic. And a spokesman for the Department of Health has attributed this fact mainly to the fact that most of the vaccines being administered have been administered in hospitals. Is there a dialogue ongoing now with the health centers that serve Hispanics? Where are those conversations going in the planning and eventually to have them vaccinated? Yeah, so we are under vaccinating uh, Hispanics in the city and we, we recognize that and we are directing more vaccine to those clinics that serve uh, that population. Uh, and uh, they're really just getting started, but we are directing more vaccine and it's important to us that they vaccinate more of their patients. Uh, in addition, we have had just in the past 24 hours or so um, meeting with um, advocacy groups that, that represent that community try to figure how to do better outreach to that community and bring them into vaccination sites. Efectivamente, nosotros no estamos vacunando tantos hispanos como debiéramos y pudiéramos y estamos tratando de transmitir instrucciones a estas clínicas comunitarias para que traten de llegar a la mayoría de sus pacientes y sus clientes. Eh, también nosotros estamos tratando de incorporar más clínicas y más centros Nosotros estamos teniendo conversaciones, las hemos tenido en las últimas 48 horas, con grupos de abogacía de esas comunidades para llegar a ellos, porque tenemos la intención de vacunarlos y llegar donde ellos estén. Gracias. Muchas gracias a ustedes. Cómo no, Argenis. Argenis, are you, uh, are you all set? Yeah, I'm set. Thank you. Let's now go to David Merrill of Philadelphia. Hi, uh, first question. I'm wondering who will mostly be eligible at the three health department first shot clinics. I mean, given that the pharmacies are taking care of the and hospitals are taking care of the, you know, over 75 and health condition workers, is it the case that basically that will be predominantly essential workers at those healthcare or sorry, city clinics? Uh, more likely it's going to be people who are, have um, high risk medical conditions, uh, particularly if they're from zip codes where they're, they've been under vaccinating uh, in those areas. Uh, and so uh, now there may be people over the age of 75, but those sort of neighborhood-based clinics are, are less for um, essential workers than uh, other opportunities. So at this point, if you're an essential worker and you are getting vaccinated, where, where's the most likely locale that that would be taking place at present? 
you know, each one is going to be handled differently. Uh, you know, so we're working directly with police and fire, for example, and we're working directly with SEPTA. Uh, and then you, you're hearing the plan today for teachers uh, through CHOP. So, we, you know, we're, we're taking those groups, uh, each one in a, a somewhat different plan. Right. Um, we're relating to the teacher CHOP plan, um, do you, could you share a little bit about like how many additional weekly doses CHOP will be getting for that effort and sort of given the eight, eight week goal timeline that you laid out, sort of what the ideal pace of weekly vaccination for teachers will be? Now, I can say that we, we think we can supply them with enough to, to whatever's necessary. Uh, we figured out, I mean, our, our best guess is that perhaps 20,000 people will be vaccinated as part of that. And so over a period of weeks, we know that we can uh, provide 20,000 doses. And just the, the 20 K is, is, is that total number of staff or the percentage of staff you think likely to take the vaccine? It takes into account the percentage that we think are likely to take the vaccine. So the number could go up or down from there, but we think we can support them either way. Right. Um, and then just the last question I had, um, I'm in, I, this is kind of asking you to speculate Dr. Farley, but, um, I'm just wondering about given the lowering consistently lowering case counts in Philadelphia, the last few weeks, um, I'm curious if you, as it relates to the, the potential presence of the variant, if, if you think that necessarily means that the variant is perhaps not as prevalent here as it is elsewhere, or that it may be, but the, the restrictions that currently exist are just doing well enough to, you know, sort of check any potential, you know, spike due to the variant. I mean, I, do you have any sort of inkling one way or the other where, where you would land on that question? Yeah, so first there, there's more than one variant. Uh, there's the one from the United Kingdom, which we know is in this country and is it's a pretty small percentage of the uh, viruses that are circulating, but growing rapidly. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at what's happening in the United Kingdom right now, case rates are falling very rapidly. So it does seem that the, like the restrictions can prevent spread even with the United Kingdom variant. More concerning to me is the variant uh, from South America, or South Africa rather, and perhaps ones from Brazil uh, where the vaccine may be less effective. Uh, so I would say right now I'm optimistic that the steps we are taking are keeping the uh, the virus uh, rates going down and will continue to do so for at least another two or three months. After that, all bets are off whether one of these variants uh, comes into play and whether that might uh, cause rates to go up or, or whether at that point we will have enough people vaccinated to prevent that from happening. Thanks. All right. Thank you, David. And finally, we will wrap up our questioning today with Pat Loeb of KYW. Uh, Mayor Kenny, you said you'd signed up for a vaccine. Are you in Group 1B? No, I'm in 1C, I believe. I went on the city site, signed up for it, put in all my all my things that are wrong with me. Um, um, usually, it just over, um, and uh, they said accepted. I uh, will contact you when you have a spot, and I'm expecting it till I'm hoping like you know April, May, or whatever. So we'll see. Okay, so people can sign up now. Yes. Even if they're not in one. Day. I mean, you're not going to get it. You're not. You're not going to get a date when you, when your information is accepted. But you will get confirmation that you're in. You're in the queue, uh, based on your age, uh, your other conditions around you, your conditions in your body, your your weight, your all those things. Uh, you'll be given a date to come in. Great. Thank you so much. That's why everybody needs to wear their mask. All right. Thank you, Pat. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We um, do have one last quick question that I'm going to try to squeeze in from Imena Conde of WHYY, who asks about the um, homicides that took place in Philadelphia. I know we have Erica Atwood um, here with us, um, uh, Mayor. And Erica, I don't know if you have uh, could spare a minute to just address that question. It did to comment on the uh, rash of homicides in the last 24 hours. Erica, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Erica Atwood. I serve as senior director for the Office of Policy and Strategic Initiatives for Criminal Justice and Public Safety. Uh, just a quick comment, um, what we saw or what we've been seeing, um, not only in 2020, but at the start of 2021, um, has been um, mind-blowing and, and tremendously 
unfortunate. Um, that outrageous violence we saw just in the last 24 hours is beyond appalling. Um, we are putting all of our efforts into rectifying this issue. Um, we are doing a number of things, um, including reevaluating our roadmap to safer communities, making some pivots and putting resources into the areas that we know are experiencing um, violence at the highest levels. We are working in concert with PPD, uh, Police Department on these efforts. We are also working with a number of operating departments to not only um, do some interim um, kind of stop gate uh, uh, repairs to what's happening in the in neighborhoods. Um, but we are putting all of our resources towards kind of environmental issues as well. Um, we uh, are looking to kind of put forth a new framework for the roadmap in the next few weeks. Um, and so you will continue um, to hear from us as we are addressing this issue because we know that it is paramount and as paramount of a pandemic as COVID-19. Uh, thank you, Erica, and thank you, Jimena, for uh, posting that question in the chat. And with that, we will conclude the Q&A and move now to Armando for the Spanish language translation of the mayor's and Dr. Farley's opening remarks. Palabras del alcalde Jim Kenney para el 9 de febrero del 2021. Buenas tardes. Como muchos de ustedes saben, ayer anunciamos que el Hospital del Niño de Filadelfia en un nuevo programa de vacunación contra el COVID-19. Este esfuerzo conjunto tiene como objetivo vacunar a los maestros, directores y personal de todas las escuelas de Filadelfia. Este grupo incluye a los trabajadores de todas las escuelas autónomas, independientes y parroquiales que administra el distrito escolar, así como los centros de cuidado infantil y a los proveedores de pre-kinder. Se espera que el esfuerzo de vacunación comience a finales de febrero y se expanda a varios centros de vacunación de la ciudad, incluyendo las clínicas emergentes dentro de las escuelas de Filadelfia. Aún estamos trabajando para ultimar detalles operativos, pero queríamos compartir esta información con nuestros residentes. A medida que nos acercamos al primer aniversario de la pandemia, lograr que los niños regresen a las aulas en toda la ciudad es de vital importancia para su futuro. Por lo tanto, me emociona profundamente ver que el Hospital del Niño de Filadelfia está dando un paso adelante de manera importante para nuestros niños. Si bien apoyamos plenamente el plan del Dr. Haidt de tener a los estudiantes de regreso en las aulas la semana del 22 de febrero, también sabemos que este programa de vacunación contribuirá en gran medida a aliviar algunas de las preocupaciones que han expresado los maestros. Es imperativo que nuestros niños vuelvan al aprendizaje en persona, en especial los más pequeños. Y todos los habitantes de Filadelfia debieran estar agradecidos a que el Hospital del Niño, o CHOP, por sus siglas en inglés, pueda ofrecer sus recursos y su experiencia para impulsar esta importante iniciativa. Quería mencionar rápidamente otro asunto importante. Hemos hablado antes sobre el programa de ayuda a los restaurantes y gimnasios afectados por la crisis del COVID-19 en Filadelfia. Este esfuerzo fue creado para brindar al menos un poco de alivio a dos industrias que se han visto particularmente afectadas durante la pandemia. La solicitud para este programa de subvenciones de 12 millones de dólares cierra hoy a las 11.59 de la noche. Por lo tanto, este mensaje va dirigido a los propietarios y operadores de gimnasios y restaurantes. Si usted aún no ha presentado la solicitud, hágalo antes de esta medianoche. Las subvenciones se otorgarán en función a la elegibilidad y la alineación con las prioridades del programa, por lo que no es demasiado tarde para ingresar su solicitud. Las subvenciones se estiman hasta en 15 mil dólares por empresa. Las empresas pueden presentar su solicitud en línea yendo al sitio fila.gov barra diagonal RGRP. En este sitio web también tenemos una lista de organizaciones que pueden ayudar a las empresas a completar la solicitud, incluyendo servicio de traducción y asistencia tecnológica. Sin embargo, la mayoría de estas organizaciones comunitarias solo estarán disponibles durante el horario comercial normal, por lo que deberá comunicarse pronto si necesita ayuda para presentar su solicitud antes del plazo límite. Y esta es la actualización en materia de salud para el día 9 de febrero del 2021. El número de casos, felizmente, va disminuyendo. Hoy proporcionaremos actualizaciones sobre la epidemia e información actualizada sobre la disponibilidad de las vacunas. Y comenzamos con los números para el día de hoy. 
Hoy confirmamos 473 nuevos casos por prueba PCR, con un total de 109.183 casos confirmados. Hay 99 casos nuevos probables detectados por la prueba rápida de antígenos. La semana pasada, del 31 de enero al 2 de febrero, el promedio de casos diario fue de 303 casos al día, basados en las pruebas PCR y de antígenos, y el 6,2% de pruebas fueron positivas. Esperamos que esta cifra cambie ligeramente. La semana anterior a esa, del 24 al 30 de enero, el promedio había sido de 371 casos por día, con un 6,3% de pruebas positivas. El número de casos sigue siendo alto, por lo que todavía necesitamos tomar precauciones, pero es importante también destacar que estamos viendo una tendencia a la disminución. Y en relación a las muertes, hoy, lamentablemente, identificamos ocho muertes, con un total de 2.955 personas fallecidas. Nosotros habíamos alcanzado un máximo de aproximadamente 100 muertes por semana a finales de diciembre. En enero, registramos un promedio de entre 60 a 80 muertes semanales y este número podría ir disminuyendo. Pasando a la vacunación, nos hemos dado cuenta que muchas personas quieren la vacuna. Hay muchas personas también que siguen frustradas por poner, no poder recibirla aún y nos disculpamos por esto. Pero tenemos límites en cuanto a las dosis que hemos recibido y a nuestra capacidad de vacunación. Estamos basando nuestro trabajo en tres principios rectores. La rapidez, cómo podemos salvar la mayor cantidad de vidas, y la equidad racial. Sabemos que tenemos mucho que hacer en este trabajo en los tres frentes, pero estamos haciendo buen progreso. En relación al suministro de vacunas, continuamos recibiendo un suministro muy limitado de vacunas. Estamos recibiendo 10,700 dosis de Pfizer y las dosis de Moderna aumentaron ahora a 14,400 dosis. Con la nueva asociación de farmacias a nivel federal, Rite Aid recibe 4,900 dosis adicionales de la vacuna de Moderna. Esta asignación es bienvenida, pero nosotros necesitamos vacunar 1,200,000 adultos en la ciudad. La vacuna de Johnson Johnson podría ser aprobada y enviada a Filadelfia aproximadamente el primero de marzo. Esta es una dosis única y necesita estar refrigerada, pero no congelada como las otras. Y es un poco menos efectiva que otras vacunas. Tiene un 72% de eficacia en la prevención de la infección, pero es un 85% efectiva para prevenir enfermedades graves. Sin embargo, sigue siendo una vacuna muy buena. Inicialmente tendremos dosis muy limitadas, de entre 5.000 a 10.000 dosis, pero será un arma más en esta batalla que tenemos que luchar. ¿Cómo se está administrando la vacuna? Hasta el domingo por la tarde se informó que 121,250 personas han recibido la primera dosis y 50,511 personas la segunda dosis. Los equipos del Departamento de Salud han visitado 83 hogares de ancianos y centros de salud a largo plazo y 42 sitios han recibido ya dos visitas de nuestros equipos. Se han integrado 17,600 dosis. La fase 1B durará aún muchas semanas. Esta fase comprende los trabajadores esenciales de primera línea y esto implica un esfuerzo continuo de su vacunación. Incluye a los socorristas, trabajadores penitenciarios e internos, a los proveedores de servicios que trabajan con poblaciones vulnerables y pronto incluirá personas que prestan servicio de transporte público. También incluye a las personas en los entornos de personas congregadas, como las instalaciones de salud mental, y conductual, a las personas mayores de 75 años de edad, a las personas con condiciones médicas de alto riesgo, especialmente aquellos que sufren de cáncer, enfermedad renal crónica, a los que han tenido trasplantes de órganos o batallan contra la diabetes. ¿Cómo se está administrando la vacuna? Primero en los hospitales, que invitan a sus pacientes a recibir la vacuna. A través de los centros de salud federalmente calificados, que deberían aumentar el número de invitaciones a sus pacientes empezando esta semana. En los hogares de ancianos y centros de atención a largo plazo. En los centros del Departamento de Salud de la ciudad, que vacunen aproximadamente entre 500 y 600 personas en los trabajadores de la salud cada semana. En las clínicas móviles, principalmente en las instalaciones de salud conductual. Y también a través de las farmacias. ShopRite tiene tres ubicaciones y Walgreens 11 ubicaciones. Friday tiene actualmente 26 ubicaciones y se van a expandir 
a 77 ubicaciones para este fin de semana. La elegibilidad es ser mayor de 75 años de edad. Por favor, no se registre aún si es usted mayor de 75 años de edad. Esperamos incluir más farmacias en el futuro y poder ampliar los criterios de vacunación más adelante. También tenemos clínicas masivas que están dirigidas por el Departamento de Salud en el Centro de Convenciones de la Ciudad. Allí estamos administrando las segundas dosis a quienes se vacunaron a través del grupo Philly Fighting COVID. Comenzamos la semana pasada y hemos vacunado ya a más de 2.500 personas del 3 de febrero al 6 de febrero. Y esperamos vacunar a 4.400 personas más del 9 al 13 de febrero. También tenemos clínicas que están siendo dirigidas por los hospitales. El 13 de febrero tendremos una en Mercy Penn Medicine en el 6121 de la avenida Cedar, cerca de la iglesia de Christian Compassion. Y próximamente anunciaremos otras clínicas. También lo estamos haciendo a través del Black Doctors COVID Consortium. Y el Departamento de Salud comenzará una serie de clínicas masivas la semana del 22 de febrero. Hemos elegido hasta ahora tres sitios. El Community Academy of Philadelphia Charter School, en la parte noreste de Filadelfia, en el 1100 este de la avenida Erie. El Martin Luther King Outdoor Adult Center, en el norte de Filadelfia, ubicado en el 2100 de la avenida Cecil B. De Moore. Y en la Universidad de las Ciencias, en el oeste de Filadelfia, ubicada en el 730 sur de la calle 43. Invitamos a las personas a que cumplan con los criterios de la fase 1B y empiecen a registrarse en el portal de la ciudad. Les estaremos enviando correos electrónicos y estaremos llamando a las personas cuando haya citas disponibles. Anunciaremos la próxima semana más información sobre los planes de las clínicas masivas que tiene planificado el Departamento de Salud. El Hospital del Niño de Filadelfia también nos ayudará a vacunar a los maestros, al personal de apoyo y al personal de cuidado infantil. Por esto, les damos muchas gracias al Hospital del Niño de Filadelfia. El personal de las escuelas públicas, las escuelas autónomas, privadas y parroquiales recibirán la vacuna. Aún quedan detalles por resolver, pero este es el plan que tenemos actualmente. Las vacunas serán administradas en el Roberts Center for Pediatric Research y aproximadamente en seis jornadas de vacunación. Las escuelas proporcionarán una lista de nombres al personal del Hospital del Niño y le notificarán al personal cómo comunicarse con el hospital para programar una cita. Aún estamos trabajando de cómo invitar al personal a cargo del cuidado infantil. Comenzaremos la semana del 22 de febrero y la meta se completará aproximadamente en ocho semanas. Si usted quiere recibir las vacunas, este es el procedimiento. Si es elegible por su trabajo, debe usted hablar con su empleador para que llene el formulario de planificación para empleadores. Si usted tiene una condición médica o tiene más de 75 años de edad, por favor consulte con su hospital o con el sistema de salud de la ciudad. Si tiene más de 75 años, usted puede obtener la vacuna a través de la red de farmacias. Si usted no está seguro, puede registrar su interés en recibir la vacuna yendo a fila.gov barra diagonal vaccine interest. Si usted es joven y saludable, aún debe esperar. Anunciamos también una nueva forma de comunicarse con nosotros. Si usted es un empleador de trabajadores esenciales, debe registrarse en fila.gov barra diagonal business vaccine. Esto se indica para cualquier empleador de cualquier tamaño y no solo para las empresas con fines de lucro. En cuanto a las restricciones del plan más seguro en casa, el 16 de enero retrocedimos con cautela en las restricciones iniciales. Permitimos el servicio en el interior de restaurantes con una capacidad máxima del 25%. Sabemos que comer al aire libre es más seguro que comer en interiores debido a la ventilación. Estamos trabajando con los restaurantes en la ventilación estándar para aumentar la capacidad en interiores. Si los restaurantes pueden lograr una ventilación excelente, pueden aumentar hasta en un 50% su capacidad de asientos en el interior. Los estándares con que contamos, si es que tienen calefacción o sistema de aire acondicionado central, es que el porcentaje del aire que viene al exter del exterior sea mayor al 20%. También deben usar filtros MERV 11 o de categoría superior. Tiene que haber cambios de aire por hora, que tiene que ser mayor a 15 cambios en cada hora. Si no tiene un sistema de ventilación de aire acondicionado central, deben utilizar ventiladores y los cambios de aire deben ser similares a los anteriores por hora. Tenemos un formulario en el sitio web, la sección de orientación para que los restaurantes apliquen y logren incrementar el número de asientos en los interiores. Vamos a revisarlos y responderemos. 
El objetivo es hacerlo dentro de las próximas 72 horas para que esto entre en vigor el día viernes 12 de febrero. Estamos intentando equilibrar la necesidad de que las personas vuelvan a trabajar con la seguridad para sus trabajadores y sus clientes. Y esto se puede considerar como la versión 1.0 de este plan, que se ajustará a medida que aprendamos de estos estándares. No tenemos previsto realizar otros cambios por ahora, pero si las tasas de los casos continúan cayendo, podríamos tener otros cambios. Aún seguirán prohibidos los eventos en interiores, las reuniones sociales en interiores de cualquier tamaño, debido a que estas son las formas principales de propagación del virus entre los hogares. ¿Qué debería hacer la gente ahora? Saber y entender que la vacuna nos ayudará a superar esta ola de invierno, pero no totalmente, porque no hay suficientes vacunas disponibles. Tenemos la necesidad, por entonces, de seguir manteniendo el uso de las máscaras y observar el distanciamiento social. No se permiten las reuniones en interiores. Si usted necesita reunirse con otras personas, hágalo al aire libre y utilizando sus mascarillas. Debe usted seguir observando estas precauciones, incluso si ya ha sido vacunado. Juntos y solamente juntos podremos superar esta gran prueba. Muchas gracias. Let us uh, now conclude next Tuesday. On Vignette, 1 p.m. Thank you.